Sorry about all the satellite issues going on. I wish we could control them, but we're still sitting with these elephants. So again, I'm just going to go through the quick basics. We're live from the middle of the African bush. We're sitting surrounded by a herd of elephants. Well, they're not so much surrounding us as in front of us now. Sorry about that. I heard a Franklin alarm call and I got distracted. I think a slender mongoose just chased a squirrel. Uh, my name is Brent. I've got Gert or Carrot on camera, depending. You can use either. On the other vehicle is Jamie and Jandre. And final control is Rebecca and Louise. And the Ellie's are heading down towards the road. So we're going to try to jump up ahead of them. And of course, being live, you can ask us questions. And if you would like to do that, send me an email questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter So these eddies, I think, are moving down this little river system. Sorry, I was just playing with my game drive radio there. It doesn't seem to be working at the moment, but I'll fiddle with that a little later. So while we try to catch up with the rest of the elephants, uh, let's say good afternoon to Jamie. Good afternoon and welcome on this sunset safari. And it seems as though our search for the spotted cats has led us to finding a very stripy animal. In this case, three zebra stallions making their way straight into the area where we think the leopard was this morning. So we do apologize for those of you who were watching our sunrise safari this morning. You never got to find out the end of the story which was that if you were watching this morning, we were frantically following alarm calls from monkeys in a drainage line around Arethusa. We had tracks for Shadow and for a male leopard. And that is where we have returned to once again this afternoon to try and find them. But we have found some unexpected zebra instead. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Jandre on camera with me. We're going to try and find you another spot to look at these zebra. There's actually more further ahead. It also gives me a chance to just investigate whether or not there are any leopard tracks around here. So there was mass confusion this morning. Frantically alarm calling monkeys, but really angry, and it was clearly a leopard. There was a, uh, monkeys get a certain tone where a leopard is concerned that is not matched by any other animal. And the last time we saw Shadow, she was with her four-month-old cub. Now, Shadow is a female leopard that has her territory in this area. And she was busy. She, was, she had a monkey kill that she was sharing with her little cub. Now, that also explains why monkeys become so terribly frantic when they encounter something like a leopard. I'm trying to get a good view of these zebra. They all appear to be pulling a funny face. But... Unfortunately, they're also playing quite hard to get for now. But I think there's something... There's definitely some, Maybe it's biting flies. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That took me by surprise. No, there's definitely something bugging me. More bugging them and me. Making me sneeze. But I noticed that earlier with the stallions that they were pulling funny faces and twitching. And I wonder whether or not there isn't some kind of biting fly around, or there's something sm that smells odd on the ground. Leopard scent, perhaps? Look at them, they're, they're all sort of... They keep pulling, pulling strange faces. There, they're doing it again. That's bizarre. I wonder what on earth is going on. Well, as the zebra move off, Chandra and myself are going to concentrate really hard on finding shadow as the search for shadows, or search for shadow, makes its way into day two. We're going to send you back over to Brent and his elephants. We'll catch up with you shortly. Uh. 
So we're still sitting with these ellies. They haven't quite moved out of the thickets yet, so we're just going to wait patiently and see that one closest to us is actually feeding off a green thorn. A uh, green thorn is also known as a torchwood or a balanites tree. Not really common fare for elephants, but because of the drought we're experiencing, they're going to eat multiple different species. Let's we'll move a little bit further back, see if we can... Oh, as long as you're going to move towards us, let's see if we can get a slightly better view. Ah, and not only is it feeding off a green thorn, it's also feeding off a little monkey orange um, or strychnos. Let's have a look. No, it's feeding over the strychnos at the moment and it is eating the green thorn. Now we're now in the center of the herd again. There's elephants on either side of us. But unfortunately, most of them are in some quite thick areas. So we'll stick with the one out in the open. Incredible. Oh, quickly across to Jamie. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Hello, little one. Shame. The, the plane's making them nervous, guys. Let's just let them relax a little bit. After two days of searching, we've got Shadow and her cub dashing off into the bushes. Yes. Finally. I cannot tell you how good that feels after coming so close to finding them yesterday to have them now is an absolute pleasure I'm so glad that this has worked out the way it has oh what an enormous relief okay I'm gonna keep my distance for now she's a bit nervous I don't know if there's, it's because of the male or because of that plane. I think it's because of the plane. Hello, little one. Aren't you gorgeous? <laughs> it's only the second time I have seen Shadow's little four-month-old cub. Oh, and what a pleasure it is. We're going to stay with her. We're going to keep our distance. We're going to try and stay on the outside edge as much as possible. So why I'm so full of joy, apart from just, you know, there's a leopard cub in front of me. Because yesterday we were so close to finding Shadow. And I had to leave the area and I was devastated. And we came so close again this morning. So to have this luck now is an absolute marvel. Oh, it's going to get really tricky in here. Oh, what beautiful timing. What beautiful, beautiful timing. I've been determined. I dreamt about this all of last night. I'm not even joking. I really did. I was dreaming about finding Shadow and there we have her. Okay, as you can see, I'm doing quite big loops around her. Little cub is through there. Mom is very relaxed. It's just the, the plane scared the little one. She's going in through there. Okay, we're going to try and do one last view. Cub's coming through that gap there. And then I'm going, no, okay. It's disappeared. I'm going to send you across to Brent. And I'm going to concentrate for now. I'll be back with you shortly. There we go, we've caught up with the rest of the herd down in the little riverbed. We've got some youngsters in front of us here. 
Oh, we're being stalked. Come in front of me. Look, we're going to get a little boy coming to give us some nonsense. He might. He looked like he was stalking us till he realised that he'd been spotted. Ah, right, no, there it is. Hello, little monsters. These young elephant bulls are so full of games, and like pushing and playing. And these guys are a year and a half, year, yeah, year and a half old. And you see, he's digging in the riverbed, actually digging out a root by the looks of things there. Not very seriously though. Still be quite reliant on mom's milk. No, he's just playing. He likes making dust. Proper little boy. Having a lot of fun in a little sandy river there. It does look like he has found some little things to eat there that he's using his foot to dig out. I wonder what that is. It looks like little tubers that he's found there. Probably could be tubers from the grass that grow in the riverbeds. Now, Mary in Missouri is wondering if I think elephants have taste buds. I most definitely do, Mary. Um, they definitely do prefer certain trees over others, but and certain fruits over others. But in a drought like this, uh, they'll eat stuff that's probably not quite as tasty to them as they normally would, just to keep themselves sustained. Oh, here comes a big cow. Now, Kim Kim is wondering how much an elephant head can weigh. Well, on a big female like that, Kim, uh, probably oh, a good half, 10, 500 kilograms. And on a big male elephant, probably nearly as much as a ton. Um, so nearly a thousand kilograms. A big male elephant can weigh up to about uh, six tons. And a female about three, three and a half tons. But while we sit with these ellies, let's go back to Jamie and that gorgeous leopard cub. Here we go. Our gorgeous little leopard cub. Shadow is a surviving member of her most recent litter. And isn't she a beauty? I'm giving them plenty of space. You can see she's relaxing nicely, but we are just going to maintain this distance between the three of us, or four of us, I suppose. We can't, can't not count Jandre. This is absolutely so exciting. I really am thrilled that we could share this moment with you. Mom is off to the right, and they have found themselves a refuge in a peltiforum tree or a weeping wattle. There you go, mom is in the tree itself but unfortunately Jandre doesn't have the best view of her. Now we're, you're back with us and we don't have the most fantastic view but we are going to just stay. This little cub is very very relaxed. She's had plenty of vehicle activity around her, especially since Shadow decided to den in a spot that was right on a main road. But the combination of our arrival timed with the aeroplane coming past, mainly the aeroplane, was what spooked her 
a little bit, but you can see now she is relaxing beautifully. And we've kept a very healthy distance between us, mom, and cub. If you are, this, if this is your first safari, this is Shadow, the nine, nearly ten-year-old female, daughter of Karula, the Queen of Juma, and her newest addition, who was born in March. And Sandy in Florida. Yes, I did indeed this morning say there was a male leopard. We knew we, was, we were following Shadow, but um, we picked up on male leopard tracks as well. And we, got, we sort of came to a point where we were very, very confused about what it was that the monkeys were so upset about. Sandy, no, this little cub isn't in any major danger. When we stopped to look at the tracks properly, it was clear it was either Tingana or Anderson in this area. And the reason I know that is just sheer size. If it were Sandile or another young male, another young mysterious male, there is no way that they would be the size that they were. These were big male tracks. And they came in here. Now, Shadow would not bring her little cub into this particular spot if she felt that there were danger from if there was a danger from a male. So she seems to be perfectly relaxed and content and I'm really hoping that they are going to plan on spending their afternoon at this Peltiforum tree in the safety of its boughs, but you really you don't need to be worried at all. Just, the female leopard shadow, she's mated with Tingana, definitely, and, and Anderson male, definitely. So they are both potential fathers of our brand new little cub. But we don't need to stress too much about the fact that there is another male in this area. Right, guys, there are people coming out on Game Drive now, so I'm going to call them and let them know that we're in now. It gets a bit tricky here because our Game Drive comms are somewhat, not always the best, but Mom is lying down, which is really good news. It means that she's planning on spending a little bit of time with this cub, and therefore we've got a little bit of time. So while we just hop on the Game Drive channel very quickly so that I can chat to the guys, we're going to send you back to Brent for now. Oh, she's going to come down the tree, of course. Silly girl. Oh no. Okay. Wonderful. Little cub coming down the tree. We've got to see that. Oh. You're settling at the base. I was so worried that you were going, you were going to miss mom coming down. But luckily, that has not been the case. I wonder if Shadow is off on a hunt. Guys, I do need to hop on the Game Drive channel. Uh, stations, I've got Shadow and Bantuan here, um, just to the south east of that drainage where we had the monkey alarm calling on Buff Skull South. I went off the road at Buff Skull, Buff Skull, Buff Skull South to the east. you adorable little thing so mom has left has she told little cub to stay or is she going to carry on let's just wait and see because it changes things I think she's told this little cub to start moving off okay shadows now mobile it looks as though she's leaving the bantuan here I'm not sure what your policy is in terms of numbers. It's quite open where we are. No, negative. You won't get visual of me from the road. Um, but you will see where my tracks go off. I should have marked with a branch, but we were just moving in to make sure we established visual. Sorry guys, bear with me. 
I'm just guiding one of the other vehicles in and that's ideal for us because it means that we are able to pass on control of the sighting to them. I'm not sure what is happening with Brent, if he has gone black screen, if he's vanished or not. I do need to just concentrate on trying to get other people in here. It is very, very tricky. You saw the area that we were in. So we do need to, for now, send you across to Brent. I will be back with you shortly. So we're still with the Ellies and our two little hooligans have had a third join them, slightly older but well, they're having a grand old time in the riverbed so he's still digging up, it looks like little tubers off the grass uh, off the reeds that grew once there was water a very long time ago. They're really making the most of every little bit of morsel they can get. Now, Ronga is wondering if I've ever heard of an elephant sneeze. Well, I have indeed. Now, like most animals with noses, they are capable of sneezing, but they do have such intricate uh, hairs inside their nose, so it's not too often that they do sneeze. I think this is more of a game than actual too much feeding going on here. A little bit of pushing and shoving. So you guys just gotta be on the game drive. Afternoon Andrew, just at Lumbi Van Love, Central Road at Giraffe Crossing. using a foot there to remove that little piece of reed. I just want to see what they get out of there. If there is a tuber underneath or just the root system. Oh, and there's a fourth little guy arriving. And all look to be little boys as well. No little girls in this little group. There we go. You see, he's got a tuber. He dug up a tuber from that reed system. There it is. Oh, it's going to be gone in a second. He's just cleaning the sand off it before popping it in the mouth. Oh, and there goes the tuba. So the tuba's have gone down the gullet. So let's go back to Jamie and those beautiful cats. <laughs> it's an odd sentence that one doesn't hear every day. The tuba has gone down the gullet. Here we are. We are still with the marvelous Shadow and her beautiful little baby. Oh stretching out just a little foot poking its head out over the top of the termite mound to her right and there is Shadow absolutely awesome okay guys I'm just gonna have a quick chat to Cedric let him he's the one that is approaching us in the sighting she's up again so we are Sort of, it's a difficult one, everybody, because she is constantly moving. We don't want to follow her when it gets too thick. So we are being extra specially careful in terms of the way in which we approach this. Because there goes Shadow now.
<laughs> Watching mom disappear. And the little cub tends to wait for a little bit, delay its departure, and then go shooting off in her direction. And they are, hello gorgeous. Are you beautiful? Are you absolutely beautiful? And what we don't want to do is follow the cub or switch on and stress it out in a, at a time when it's separated from mom. So we'll watch it for a little bit and we'll wait for it to see if and decide if it's going to go dashing off after mom. How's it, Cedric? Hi. Hi, guys. Oh, little one. Disappearing behind the termite mound. Guys, I can't reposition now, obviously. We definitely don't want two engines on during this sighting, so we're just going to settle for now and just wait and see what happens while Cedric repositions. I think the cub is still on the termite mound, I think it's just on the other side, but I really don't want to stress the cub out in any way. So we're not going to turn on the vehicle, we are just going to sit here patiently and wait for our opportunity to move. We're not going to go just yet though. We are going to have an opportunity to spend some time with it. You can hear the cysticulars alarm calling at shadow. And a very warm welcome on our sunset drive to Fee Evans, who is thrilled to hear, or to finally see Shadow after hearing so much about her. And Dave and herself would like to know at what point will the little cub start learning to hunt. There, look, yeah. there we go. Head sticking out there on the termite mound. Watching us. Hello, little one. Sorry, Fee and Dave. I do have to get on the Game Drive channel and then I will explain that to you in a moment. Yeah, standing by. That's affirmative. I heard the cysticulars though sounding a bit more east of that um, termite mound. Okay, sorry guys. And to Fee and to Dave, the little cub will start to hunt. Even now, she will be practicing and building up her skills. But she won't be fully in def... Ah, oh, is Cedric just telling me where Shadow is? Um, she won't be fully independent until she's about a year and a half or even closer to two years old. Uh, now you learn to hunt and they make their first kills in terms of little squirrels, little mongoose, anything like that. That's usually around eight or so months of age, eight or nine, depending on the cub. I heard a rumor of a little leopard cub, and it was a female. And it's usually the females that learn to hunt sooner than the males. They show a lot more independence. But it was a female cub that killed a male impala at nine to ten months of age. Or not a male impala, an adult impala. Now that to me is the most incredible thing I have ever heard of. There's a female called Saleheshe that lives next door to Shadow, her territory it borders on Shadow's territory, and she, her cub, Tiani, who has only recently been named, is rumored to have killed an impala at nine months of age. But that is remarkable, truly remarkable. Hello, look at that face. Are you gorgeous? Look at those green eyes. Such a contrast to Karula's little ones. Karula's little ones, of course, with the male, Hosanna's eyes, being a mixture of brownish-blue, and his little sister, Shungile, with the bright, sparkling brown eyes. Really, really rare to see in a leopard. But their little... what would they be? They would be... oh, they'd be this cub's niece, and uh, they'd be the, her aunt and uncle, weirdly enough, since their mother is Shadow's mother, and Shadow is this little cub's mother. But she's got bright, sparkling green eyes. And I have to say, I really have a soft spot for this little, gu this little girl. After all of the drama that she went through. Hello, gorgeous. Are you beautiful? And that combined with the fact that when I last saw her, she had a monkey kill and hissed at mom. 
when mom went to try and to feed on it. And look at how enormous her ears look. Don't her ears look too big for her face? You are such a gorgeous little girl. You really are. So special. See, I told you. I dreamt of it all last night. It had to happen. Absolutely had to happen. She's looking back in the direction. Cedric is with her mother, Shadow, about 20 meters away, 60 feet. And Gilly, I'm really sorry to have to break this news to you. Um, I keep forgetting, of course, that people don't necessarily watch every single day. Gilly, Shadow did have two cubs initially. She lost one. We don't know how. We know that it happened at the beginning of May. We don't know exactly when, but we know that it was around between the sort of the 1st to the 5th of May. No, between the 1st to the 10th of May. That was the period during which she was seen with one cub, and then the sec or with two cubs, and then all of a sudden, just one the whole time. So I'm, it is that really sad aspect of life. I know that you are familiar with that in terms of leopard cub mortality. A 70% rate will die. 70% of leopard cubs, statistically, will die before their first birthday. Okay, let's reposition, guys, and get a little bit of a better view now that the cub is relaxed once again before we do have to leave the sighting. And no problem there, you can watch as we do. You can make sure that our, we keep a nice eye on our cub. She's just ducked behind the termite mound, so I want to make sure that she hasn't, isn't moving to mom because I don't want to make her feel pressured in any way. Now let's just see what she's doing. Give her a nice wide berth. But this little cub has no shortage of spunk and no overload of fear. She is a bundle of joy and mischief to all of us. No, she's moved. Let's just wait. You can see she's gone off the termite mound. And I'm just going to contact Cedric. Uh, Cedric, have you guys got visual of the Bantuan coming towards you? Okay, copy. I'm going to stand by here. Just call me when you think it's okay to approach. She's calling her cub. Obviously decided that the distance between the two of them was a little bit too great. So giving that almost frog-like call. So while our little cub dashes off in that direction, Amy J, you wanted to know whether or not a little leopard cub like Shadows might, if it didn't have a sibling, whether or not it would play with another leopard cub if it encountered it. Ah, oh, there it goes. I just saw brief movement going towards Mom. Chandra, I don't think you'll be able to see... Although, Jean-Dre's eyes are sharp, and he's got a little bit of height on me. And just wait to reposition. So Amy J, yes, probably. I mean, it's difficult for it to, for, to answer that. I think initially, you got it. How did you manage that, Jean-Dre? That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Look at that, everybody. Look at the spots. Bravo to Jandre. That is really very, very impressive. Okay, we can reposition now because it means the cub is there. Sorry, Amy J. Um, yes, in terms of playfulness, I think the little cub initially would be very reticent. A wild cub has a natural fear of almost everything out here. So it definitely doesn't want to run the risk of encountering something strange and 
risking being killed or injured. However, I think that that fear would very quickly subside and then yes, I think a little leopard cub would potentially play with a playmate in that way. Nice and slowly through here. need to concentrate here on figuring out exactly where she is and getting around without scaring her. And it is lovely to hear from Brent. Uh, she's mobile. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Brian. It is so lovely to hear from you, Brian, in Toronto. Well done, Jean-Andre. Wonderful work. Well, there's a swath, there's a series. Oh, there she goes, there she goes. In front of us there. Guys, this may actually be the last visuals that we get of her. I'm not going to push too much. Here comes Cub. I just saw Cub. I just lost Cub. It's very tricky. <laughs> I'm just going to wait for Cedric to reposition. He's going to keep track of her for us. We're not going to both follow her through the bush, obviously. We'll wait until she settles once again. But while we wait, Brian from Toronto, as I was trying to say, it is so lovely to hear from you. You wanted to know how many leopard cubs we have within our Traverse region, and the answer is five that we know of. Um, I'm not counting Salayesha's cub. Salayesha's cub would make it six. So there's Karula's two cubs. Shadow's got one cub. Tundi's got two cubs, as far as we know. Might be more, though. We're not 100% sure on that. We know that Tundi has given birth. And she spends... She, we're not going to be seeing her for a while, because she's given birth on Chitwa. But she will be moving into our Traverse area at some point in that time. So there you go. How lucky are we? When it rains, it pours in the most positive way possible. Since this is a bit tricky, um, and since I do need to just chat to Cedric, I'm going to send you across to Brent and find out if his afternoon is going well. So we've decided to come check on another set of cubs that are on Juma at the moment. And you see perseverance pays off. Jamie's been chasing Shadow and Cub, I think, for four drives now. And she's finally got them. So really exciting. I think it's only the third time we've seen that little one. Um, I think yeah, I've, I've only seen it once. I think this is Jamie's second sighting of that little cub. Now, we've spent a lot of time in this area over the last couple of a week or so. And we've got that Nkuhuma lioness who's got her den just in here with those three little cubs. I'm just going to check if she's still here. It looks like she is. She hasn't been lying in the best position for us to see uh, those little cubs feeding, but it's always worth coming to have a look. Well, at least she's... Her belly's facing us now, so we might actually get a better view of the cubs. Have a look. Okay, there she is there, and it looks I can see an engorged nipple. Now, where are the little monsters? It looks like one just lying next to her there. Look at her paw draped over the branch. Looks very, very comfortable. They're not feeding at the moment that I can see. But it might be worthwhile just sitting here for a little bit and trying to see what's going on. There's a mom's tail flick there. 
know, she hasn't moved very far at all since the sunrise safari. Now where her paw is trapped, I thought I saw a little bit of movement just underneath there. There could be a little one there. She has chosen a specifically good den site to hide these little cubs in. Well, they could be lying behind her back. There, there we go. Underneath her paw, there's one. I thought I saw some movement there. Here we go. Okay. I just need a call on the radio to let them know I'm here. It seems like my radio, time choice to use the radio both this morning and this evening, uh, seems to be when everyone else wants to talk to each other. One station with the Mofazi Angala to the east of Offal's Hook Dam. Here we go. Oh, you can just see the little movement there in the cub again, just below her paw. Come on, guys, crawl out into the open. Come say howdy. Hopefully, if we play the patience game here, we'll be able to get some brilliant views of the little ones a bit later when Mo, Mo moves. She looks so comfortable. The poor draped over that fallen branch of a knob thorn tree. So Abby Sheck's wondering at what age will these little guys join the pride? I'd say they're probably at oldest about two weeks old now. They normally join the pride at around well, it depends on the individual. They're normally around eight weeks, eight to ten weeks. Oh, did you see something? Ah, no. So at about eight to ten weeks, they'll normally join the pride. Sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit earlier. It just depends on the individual a female and that pride. So the other guys who are about eight, nine weeks old have already joined the pride and have already been to a buffalo kill with the pride. So they're still probably another six weeks or so before they even think about taking these little guys towards the pride. But not much movement happening here. So from one set of cubs, well, even though we can barely see them, to a cub, another cub with Jamie. Hello gorgeous, aren't we? Just having the most marvelous time. Lion cubs, leopard cubs, we are absolutely spoilt. Our shadow does keep moving off. However, she's not hunting. She's trying to search, I think, for a place to hide her cub. Because she keeps moving off and then waiting and then calling the cub back again. In order to tell her to follow her. I think she's looking for somebody to, or somewhere to hide it. Oh, where are you going? Where are you going? You're going up the termite mound, hmm? Is that the way to go? <laughs> Hello little munchkin. Just um I hope you are all getting some incredible screenshots. How cool is this? 
little cub sitting on top of a termite mound, looking for all the world like a little miniature queen. Hey, gorgeous. We all get a little bit soppy when it comes to cubs, we have to confess. We, um, we don't hold it together very well. I'm just waiting for Cedric to reposition to get across to Mom, and then we will go a little bit closer. Oh, hold on, never mind. She's going to come and investigate. Oh, you are so brave. You're going up the apple leaf. Yes. How awesome is that? Four months old and just look at those tree climbing skills. Bouncing around as if she owns the trees. Sorry guys, I do have to get on the Game Bluff channel. I don't remember which of my radio comms it is. Uh, not that one, that's Final Control. Negative, uh, Bantuan's in the upper leaf. Uh, the last I saw Mufaz, she was heading towards that big marula there in front of in front of me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Trying to organize my radio life at the same time. We are going to re... Oh, whoopsie. Whoopsie, Daisy. You nearly fell out of that tree. <laughs> A little bit higher there. She jumped up and she nearly fell out. It was actually the sound of her movement that alerted me to where she was. Oh, that's the that, thinnest branch in the world you've chosen. That's not going to work very well. It's not going to work very well at all. A nice, comfortable spot. <laughs> Oopsie. Oh no. Oh, it's all gone wrong, hasn't it? Careful. Leopard cub ant antics are endlessly entertaining, especially when they're up in a tree like this. Careful now, that's a long way down. Oh, some acrobatics, what on earth are you planning on doing now? Oh, okay, gracefully turning round is apparently the answer. Oops, oops. <laughs> Careful, just there, just a little bit to the left, foot a little bit to the left. There we go, okay, you've managed to stabilize yourself now, she's now straddling the branch. Well, the only way I can see out of this little one is if you unhook that tail. Oh guys, I'm so sorry about that. We had an attack of the gremlins that clearly made life really, really difficult and you didn't get to see any of what was happening. I know it's very disappointing, but to make up for it, as you can imagine, bringing your live safari from the African bush does have its disadvantages. The lovely girls in Final Control have prepared a replay. But I, I'm going to just ask you to bear with me one moment because I'm still actually technically in the sighting and I don't, I shouldn't be. And just wait for me to move a little bit further and then I'll explain to you exactly what happened. Oh, last you saw, the little cub was bounding out of the tree and down onto the ground calling for mommy. And she found mommy straight away on the top of a termite mound and we have a lovely image of them wandering through the bush and then their reunion and the playfulness of the cub. So have a look at this clip. Oh, how incredibly special was that? I'm sorry you didn't get to see it live, but a little bit of a replay, I think, was the next best thing. Bear with me one second. I'm trying to get on the Game Drive channel to call myself out of this sighting, and every time I pick up the radio, somebody else starts a conversation. Oh, oh, here we go. 
are leaving the lock of Shalom Bantuan and Ryan on lock in Lazarus um, in the middle of the road between Pantapan and Knobthorn Open, Mobile East, and Doug approaching. Okay, there we go, that was all that I needed to do. The really cool thing about the direction that she's moving in is I think she might come back towards Juma and that is exactly what we want. I think she's leading her cub back into the block where we were searching for them yesterday. So this morning we had the frantic search for the wild dogs, wild dogs sprinting everywhere. Um, we never found them but we did find their tracks going straight past where Shadow was. We also found signs of hyena that were there from last night so whilst we think she had a kill we think she may have lost it to the hyena and she moved off away from that area because of that but now she is on her way towards a triple M and hopefully she will pop out relatively soon so I'm really glad you got to see that replay if she does come back towards Juma then things change and we will be back on the sighting We'll have, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. I'm going to send you back across to Brent, who has got one very sleepy lioness. So there's been zero movement. No movement of cubs, no movement of the female. She is fast asleep in the exact same position. We haven't moved either. Uh, and it is getting a little bit late, so we're going to one last look at the lioness sleeping in the thicket. And there's a lazy lion if I ever saw one. So there we go. As I said, it's getting a little bit later. We're going to leave here now and let this lioness hopefully tomorrow morning maybe we'll get some movement around with her and she hasn't even lifted her head as we move away now Thomas in Pennsylvania is wondering with all these lion and leopard cubs around will there be enough territory for them all well, currently, sort of yes and no, Thomas. It's not, not quite as easy as that. So, what happens with uh, lions? With lions, yes, there should be plenty. Now, what will happen is the, the lionesses, or the female cubs, will join the, the, their natal pride. So, they'll stay with their moms and aunts, and possibly even sisters at that. Uh, but male cubs at around, oops, that one nearly got me, um, at around two and a half to three years old will be pushed out um, of the pride by the dominant males, sometimes even a little bit younger. Now that's to ensure that they don't mate with their moms and sisters, so they'll be pushed away and sometimes they will wander for a couple of years and move very far from their natal pride before they are big enough and strong enough to try and uh, take over a pride of their own. Now with leopards it's a little more complex but again the girls stay behind. So what happens is female leopard cubs normally become independent from their mothers at a younger age than, than the males and what happens is the female will then sequest a small section or a core section, sorry not a small section of their core territory uh, to the female cub and uh, what will happen then is she will then normally move over uh, and extend her territory into another female's territory by fighting uh, being older and more experienced the male cubs then at about two years old uh, sometimes a little bit younger sometimes a little bit older uh, will actually eventually be chased away by their mother they'll start mating again and pushed off and those males can wander up to 400 kilometers away from their mom before they settle for territory so yes there is enough territory for them but no there's not enough territory for them on Juma 
and that's only for the boys unfortunately for the girls it's a little bit more different a little bit more complex Okay, so we're going to meander on, see what else we can find. I'm going to start heading back towards Sydney's waterhole, just in case those wild dogs from this morning decide to head back to the west. Whoop, and over the big bump. So we are in the grips of a drought at the moment. This is the worst drought since 1992. Uh, but the bush has an incredible way of recovering very quickly, so don't be too worried. It should be all fine. Oof, a bit nippy. Now, Janet's wanting to know, is there a reason most of the guides and the people on Game Drive wear neutral colours? Well, there's a quite a big misconception that animals uh, get offended by bright colours. They don't. Um, unless you're walking, it's not, very, uh, not a big deal at all. If you're in a car, you can wear bright pink. And I guarantee you the lion would not care. It's more, I think, personally, so you don't offend the other people driving around by wearing horrific colours. Uh, but most colours are fine out in the bush. Strangely enough, the colours that stick out the most for the animals are black and white. So any solid colour um, would stick out most for, for the animals. Now, a lot of animals see in various shades of grey. So that's why black and white would be the most prominent colours for them to see. Now, jersey's on, everything's back in order. Didn't pull my ears out, no I didn't. So I said my plan is I'm gonna head west towards the area around Sydney's waterhole. There is a possibility those wild dogs we were tracking this morning might cut back uh, towards their den, which is probably 10 kilometers to the southwest of us. that. Oh, so unfortunately sometimes off vehicles and I by no means think it's on purpose, uh, especially with building vehicles, there's bags of stuff on the back and occasionally litter will blow out. So whenever we see it we make sure we pick it up. Wow, this at one stage is definitely from a building crew, but it was a giant bag. And when I say a giant bag, I don't think I've ever seen a bag of ginger biscuits that big. Well, of course, uh, I think what happened is it just accidentally blew off the back of the car. So if we do oh, see anything, we always try to pick it up. That colour scheme is not something you see too often out here in the bush, so caught my eye as I was driving down. Now we have to go through the whole ear process again. There we go, back in. Remember, we are in a live safari. And we do apologize for some of the stream issues we've been having on this Sunset Safari. 
Uh, maybe there's a solar flare. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but hopefully it'll stay sable for the rest of this Sunday evening sunset safari. And what a start you guys had before the stream went down with Jamie after four days of tracking finally caught up or four, four or five drives of tracking finally caught up with Shadow and her little bundle of joy. Uh, we've been spending quite a lot of time with that Inkahuma lioness hoping to get a really good view of those little cubs. Alas, we've had a few views and I'm still waiting for that magic moment and the amount of time we spend there, I'm sure it's going to happen soon. Well, everyone's saying apparently thank you for picking up the rubbish. It's on my pleasure and I will always pick up rubbish when I see it. And while we head towards Sydney's waterhole and the hope of the African wild dog, let's go see how Jamie's going. Let us keep our fingers crossed that those African wild dog do return once again to Juma. Now, the one thing we haven't been lacking over the last, I would say the last five days, has been kudu and water buck. This partic I don't know why it is, maybe I've just had some luck with them, but <laughs> for some reason all I've, in terms of antelope, I have just seen so many kudu and water buck. It is astounding. In this case, if you are new to the safari, this is a kudu, definitely one of the most attractive little antelope, with their enormous ears and their enormous eyes. They are absolutely beautiful. And I'm still waiting and listening, just an update for you. That shadow is still moving to the east. So we'll keep listening to that. Hopefully she pops out then. So Kudu giving us a perfect demonstration of how well the stripes work to hide, and hide the animal's outline as it moves through dense vegetation. Something I've realized, we found Shadow, but we never tracked down that male leopard. And I think perhaps we should think about going back and having a look for him and see whether or not Tingana might be in the region. Sorry, I was just listening to the Game Drive channel. The guys picked up on some male leopard tracks, but they are not in our Traverse area. So yes, as I was saying, the stripes of the kudu break up its outline make it a bit harder to see. Our kudu does not wear khaki in order not to in order not to offend its fellow kudu. It wears khaki because it's the perfect way of disappearing into the vegetation. And Chandra giving us the perfect example. Imagine you're a predator. And predators' eyes are attracted to movement, but just see how difficult it becomes to identify individuals in that group and single out one particular target. Where does one kudu begin and where does one kudu end? Awesome. It's actually really beautiful. It's such a beautiful time of year. All the golds and the reds and the oranges. Okay, I think let us leave our kudu for now since they've done such a magical... Oh, but that's so pretty. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle, a really difficult jigsaw puzzle. A cohort of oxpeckers sitting on her back, the birds that pluck off the ticks from in the kudu's fur. And a wonderful question from Ben, who is 14 years old. Now, but at one point recently, when we were watching Kudu, I did the, well, the Kudu Flem and Grimace, and then I did my own imitation of the Kudu's Flem and Grimace. Every, every time I see Herbert now, he comes up to me and says, Jamie, please do the Flem and Grimace for me. It really please does. Do <laughs> Can't keep a straight face. <laughs> Especially with Jandre zooming right in. You can just see the camera lens go, zoom. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. I'm being silly now. So, phlegm and grimace is that facial expression. I'm not exaggerating. That is what the animals do. They lift up their top lip 
and they scrunch up their nose and John is going to zoom in again and what that actually does what the purpose that that actually serves stuff for Chandra <laughs> is it um it opens up the organ of Jacobson or the vomeral nasal organ that sits on the top of their palate and allows them essentially to taste smell now Ben's question is do all animals phlegm and grimace almost all of them do um it, it, at least all mammals do in especially in this area there is one in particular that immediately jumps to mind that cannot phlegm and grimace and that's an elephant because imagine an elephant doing that definitely wouldn't work with a very large trunk in the way so what they do instead ben is they touch the smell with their trunk so they they touch it if, if it's urine or whatever it may be and then they take the trunk and they put it in their mouth onto the organ of jacobson and that is the equivalent of an elephant's phlegm and grimace best phlegm and grimace of all the animals i feel is the white rhino it looks as though it's puckering up for a really big kiss a really big sloppy kiss and of course they've got those broad flat lips so it's absolutely wonderful no i'm not doing the phlegm and grimace <laughs> i'm not no no i have thrown my my dignity upon your mercy and you proved to be merciless i'm not uh, no more phlegm and grimaces today <laughs> but it's a very good question from ben and then you know of course that the organ of Jacobson is most important in our reptile family and there's no reptiles that phlegm and grimace at all they will instead that's what the flickering tongue motion is all about it's about sensing the air particles or picking up the particles that are creating the smell the chemicals that are creating the smell and placing them bringing them drawing them back into the mouth and to the organ of Jacobson and technically the organ of Jacobson is only reptiles the males have a vomeral na mammals not males mammals have a vomeral nasal organ but it's essentially become the same thing for just in terms of ease of description so a lovely question ben i'm trying to think if there's any other mammals that i have never seen phlegm and grimace of course the leopards and the lions look terrifying when they do it um mongoose are really cute when they phlegm and grimace what else is there anything else no every other mammal out here ben phlegm and grimaces except i have not seen elephant shrews do it but i don't think that's quite the level of what you were asking because I, I i'm not 100 percent sure whether or not they do or do not phlegm and grimace i imagine that they do and it serves a very important function and it's something that we we have a residual vomeral nasal organ but it's completely non-functional which is why human beings don't walk up to other human beings and phlegm and grimace at them at least not without trying to be amusing in some kind of way but imagine if we did and we probably our ancestors did do that at a time when instinct where our sense of smell was far more port important to us <laughs> your the social dating ritual that has now been replaced apparently by a great deal by social media and constant messaging people and whatever other new fandangled technology happens to have hit the courting scene or the dating scene or however else it worked imagine it was in that would have been walking up to somebody having a jolly good sniff and then going at them it's not all that attractive is it it's not an attractive facial expression but it would have been the norm at the time one more time, I don't know, you're too fast on that zoom. I'm now worried I got something in my teeth. Give it a quick scrub just in case. And my lips are really dry. No, no, no more zooming in. <laughs> Let's go find out what's happening at Arethusa Dam, shall we? Moving bravely along from our bizarre facial expressions. At least I, th I feel James's are funnier though. James's phlegm and grimaces are funnier. There's just something innately funny about James anyway. I guess that might be why. I'm getting really good at spotting leopard termite mounds. Nobody panic. It's okay. It's just a termite mound this time. There's now about six people waiting to see Shadow and her cup. So I'm glad that we left when we did. Still hoping though that at some point they're going to return to us and that we can have them have the pleasure of their company on Juma tomorrow on the sunrise safari perhaps 
oh, as soon as the sun starts to disappear it gets really very chilly got a herd of impala no we have one solitary oh no there we go that's going to be impossible for Jean to show you think you want to I think it'd be nice in the backlighting oh perhaps I suppose the Sun is quite low Jean of course teaching me all kinds of things about the techniques of camera work I'm basically a cameraman now having borrowed his jacket the other night that says cameraman <laughs> cantering over the termite mound. Actually, that's really beautiful. Wow, that's pretty. And residual hormones were flowing through the impala herd. causing those deep grunting sounds from the males. And I've noticed quite a few herds recently have been split up by the rams, collecting females in the hope of being able to pass on the next set of genes. Unfortunately, they are very much barking up the wrong tree because the female estrus cycle is over. <laughs> There's alarm calls from the lodge. It sounds like small children playing in the swimming pool. <laughs> I'm frozen in mid-sentence wondering what on earth was going on there. So did she. This lovely impala on your screens. She's very pretty. We don't stop and appreciate our impala all that often. We kind of take them for granted because we see them all the time. But just look how beautiful they really are. Beautiful and exceptionally graceful. And delicate. What have you seen? She's seen something that's put her on alert, but none of the other impala seem to be terribly bothered. It may well even just be a Franklin moving off in the bushes, or some other impala that she hasn't quite managed to identify. But you don't mess with an impala's eyesight. Those things are sharp. What have you seen, lovely girl? She's not alarm calling. I think she's just seen other impala. See, it is a really, truly beautiful time of year. The golds and the reds and the oranges. Absolutely stunning. Just by the way, in case you're wondering about what's happening with Brent, he has not disappeared off your screens, but Wendy appears to be having more problems with signal black holes than normal, so you don't need to worry about him. He's absolutely fine. He's just searching for a good signal area. Gosh, this is so pretty. It's like something out of a, I don't know, I suppose, it's African wildlife at its most stunning. And as we leave our beautiful impala scenes in the afternoon wintry light, Jonathan, welcome on our sunset safari. I hope you have been having a marvelous time. We're going to carry on towards what might be a quite a noisy uh, Arethusa Dam experience, but let us go and investigate. Uh, Jonathan wants to know a little bit more about our responsibilities as guides. 
and the answer Jonathan is apart from guiding our lives safaris we certainly we are required to look after the vehicles you know, make sure that they've got fluids their tires are okay if something's wrong reporting it to the wonderful Opa who will then look into it for us and hopefully fix it those are generally our main responsibilities it's the one amazing thing about this live safari experience that I think for all of us none of us have experienced before is the fact that we have compared to a normal guiding career or a normal guiding job we actually have very few responsibilities we take the crew out every now and again to go and see a sighting or something similar but other than that if you're a d your day in the life of a safari guide especially where I used to work you would check the vehicles in the morning pack your hot box so your coffee your tea you might be able to if you have a tracker he might share those responsibilities have coffee with the guests first thing in the morning wake them up first thing in the morning take them out on game drive maybe do a walk at 11 o'clock after breakfast that you've just sat with the rest of your guests then you might have to go and do an airstrip pickup or whatever else it happens to be and then you carry on to the afternoon game drive and then you sit dinner until your, breast, your guests want to go to bed and as marvelous as that experience is it can be quite exhausting so as our as la, safari live presenters the not having to look after people not that I'm saying we don't enjoy it but to have that break from looking after people is really very pleasant we don't have to be you, you, you don't feel like you're at work when you're having dinner which you do if you're working at a safari lodge but you get on very well with your guests and it's it's wonderful but we sit with a group of friends every night and enjoy each other's company so our responsibility is basically to report problems as we see them um, we get feedback meetings where obviously we are critiqued upon our performance um, and it's not always negative it might be positive it might be talk about how we could handle the situation slightly differently what would be easier just in order to bring you guys the best possible live safari experience so that is those are the sorts of things that we do I mean our cameramen have an enormous amount of responsibility they've got all kinds of archiving and other things that Jandre does mysteriously in between drives they always seem to be incredibly busy uh, it's not just us as safari guides there wild earth functions as well as it does because it's got such an incredible team behind it and a team that works unbelievably hard at different times all right speaking of our team we have a teammate back in play and that is Brent who has found a very large elephant outside final control So when I say we're outside of final control, you can see all the elephants in the bush in front of me. When we arrived, they're actually standing. There's the bucky, and that's final control there. There's the thingamabob that jigger jags you the signal. But I think there's some more elephants out in the open up ahead. So let's see if they're down at the pan. Now this is the same massive group we were with at the beginning of the safari, and they've just slowly moved their way through here. Have a look. Ah, yes, they are some. Oh, it uh, looks like there's still some drinking, so we're going to make our way towards those ones. Elephants, elephants, you were there. Big bull disappearing there. Quite a nice set of tusks on him. Uh, no, a little bit to the right. Up on the other bank. A little come out of it. Oh no, there, there he is. Yeah. There's the big bull. You can see the nice ivory as he disappears. Looks like there's a few trouble causes down still next to the water. Oh, someone got into trouble. 
that female decided to chase the one female and set off a bit of pandemonium here. Still chasing. Lots of trumpeting. Sorry, orbs go again. Ah, copy, thanks, orbs. Now, here we go. Those are the ones that caused the commotion a bit earlier. It seems like. Is there a bit of peace being made? interesting behavior happening. Could be a bit of sorting out of social hierarchy. Oh, another female wants nothing to do with it. Now, as Mr. Eddie's moving off, Aubrey spotted something just behind us that you don't see every day. I want to see if they're still at it, so to speak. There's also a lone old buffalo bull. And that's not what we are out to see here. Oh, I did see the movement. Where have they gone? In this pile of dead stuff, there were two mating monitor lizards. So let's just wait for a second. You normally see them flailing around while they mate. They could have disappeared down a hole. see their movement and they seem to have either disappeared into the sticks or maybe even gone down a hole. Let's just try from a different angle maybe. Let's have one last quick look into the sticks. I think they must have disappeared down a hole and so while we continue to see what else is around uh, let's go back to Jamie who's at a water hole with very little water left so little water left that I actually to be completely honest I got quite a shock when I arrived here at Arethusa Dam because there's it's not so much Arethusa Dam as Arethusa Mud and that what you what you were looking at there in front of you, and of course this always happens every time we do try and zoom in and show you. That's the catfish, the remaining catfish of Arethusa Dam. And if we go further off to the right, we've got an even sadder image than the catfish, which is that of this poor hippo attempting to make the most of whatever cover he can find. And it doesn't look very pleasant, does it? I mean, there's clearly nothing to keep him submerged. He's trying to protect his sensitive skin. Sc skin? Skin? No, this is getting ridiculous now. Skin from the sun. I'm really sorry. I don't know why my speech patterns have suddenly gone completely crazy. But yes, he's protecting himself from the sun. 
but he is really struggling for an animal that is built to be aquatic. Times are phenomenally tough for the hippo of the Sabi sand. And look, you can see his bones protruding, his backbone protruding. He's not in good condition. And that is also because there is so little food for them to eat. He's not dead, by the way. Just in case you were concerned about that, he is breathing. There is movement there. Nor, in fact, is he dying just yet. He, he's, he's fine. He's just sleeping. And there is absolutely nothing we can do. Until the rains come... These sites like these are going to be pretty much a standard occurrence. The fish will survive. Some of these catfish will survive. They're going to dig themselves down, selves down into the mud, encase themselves in a mucus-like shell, and they will tough out the drought. But those of them, these huge ones, that are stuck on the top layer, look at them, look at the numbers of them. Too big even for the catfish to make off with. They are stuck. And they are really going to struggle. And just think about how little oxygen there must be in that muddy water at this point. Oh, the shivers. It's going to be the hardest aspect of watching Safari Live over the next few months. And for us living out here over the next few months. And there really is just nothing to be done. I know this is absolutely devastating to see. We will keep monitoring though. It will be fat. The one thing is that this place, if the rains will come, this area will recover and we will be here to watch it as it does and observe the way the changes that will have happened and occurred after this drought. Now, while we move on from this somewhat depressing sight, let's head back to Brent, who's got an elephant, to cheer you up. Now, we've actually got three little boys who haven't quite stopped chasing each other yet. Big gamemanship going on. And they're being left behind by the herd but they're having a great time wrestling and shoving look at that it's the same ones who caused all that pandemonium earlier <laughs> i love our little one as soon as there's a chance puts the tusks into the bottom of the bigger ones while they're distracted and fighting with each other. Nice cool weather. Just had a drink. Now it's time for playing. We're going to keep seeing what plays out between these young boys. While we do that, let's jump back on board with Jamie, who's got an eagle we don't see too often to show you. We have an eagle that we don't see often indeed. And in fact, when I said too big for the catfish to make off with, I didn't mean catfish at all. I didn't even realize that I had said that until jean -Dre pointed it out after we sent you back to the elephants. My apologies. What I meant was the catfish are too big for the fish eagles to fly off with. And there we go. We've got our fish eagle perched and surveying. Definitely one of the most iconic raptors of Africa, and South Africa in particular. And with its striking white, you can see why. Just allowing ourselves a moment of calm to take in the image that is in front of us. Yeah, 
every sunset is ever so slightly different. Every sunrise and sunset, and winter in particular, provides for some truly spectacular evening skies. Okay, we're going to move on and start sort of checking towards Red Dam and then moving on. Just by the way, quick update, they have found the wild dog. The wild dog are in elephant plains. They are all the way in elephant plains. So that's on the western side of Arethusa in the direction that we were just looking, but probably about, oh, give or take six odd kilometers. Uh, my conversions here, what would that be, about four and a bit miles, four and a half miles, something like that. I'm not very good with miles. 3.7-ish, says Jean-Dre, just mile conversion down, down to an art. All right, just let's, let us attempt to reverse off this narrow bridge. Poor Brent has lost his signal. Now let me just get off the bridge here before I answer the question. I'd prefer not to fall off, and I'm sure jean -Dre would prefer that as well. But unfortunately it is something that we have to do in reverse. Oh! There's also these concrete blocks that lie in wait to trap one. There we go, we're nearly there. Sorry everybody, we're going to do live reverse safaris. Safaris backwards. Luckily as a guide, one thing you learn to do is reverse. Mm. Okay, now that I've sufficiently twisted the muscles in my neck and we've made it onto solid ground and off the bridge in reverse, Gracie, sweetheart, I'm sorry. I know that that hippo is really, really sad to look at. I promise you he's not stuck in the mud. He just is burying himself as deeply into the mud as he possibly can. Now, Gracie is eight years old. She said that the hippo made her cry and that she will be praying for him and Gracie we've all got to be praying for some of the animals out here the animals like the hippos we wish we, there was more we could do we wish we could give them some water but we'll pray for them and just think Gracie there's going to be people watching all around the world praying for the different hippo and hopefully tomorrow he will go or tonight even as it starts to get dark he's going to go out find some dinner and then find a different dam, one that's got a little bit more water to keep him hidden and safe from the sun. But I know it's very sad and I wish, I wish, I wish I could tell you a different story. Luckily, Gracie, I know how much you love elephants and for all of you out there, Brent has got signal back again and I think we should head across to him for an uplifting elephant sighting. Hi Gracie, we've got lots and lots of elephants for you. Now these elephants are almost in our camp. Now there we go. Oh, there's a little bush buck too. Let's move forward a little bit. There we go, there's a little bush buck disappearing along there. There's the entrance to the Juma Lodges. Well, not the entrance, the fence to keep the buffalo out and the elephants out. Right, there's lots of elephants, all feeding right next to the camp. There they are. Oh, watch the elephant going to chase the bush back. <laughs> Just because it can. Be careful, little bush buck. <laughs> Just, yeah, isn't that awesome? The young elephant sort of half chased it. The older elephants just ignored, ignored it completely.
Let's try and go a little bit closer and see if there's some a bit closer to us. So final control is right next to us, yeah? They've actually walked past final control and they're heading towards the Juma research camp where most of us stay. We might even find some on the path we normally use between final control. Now, Kathy in Tennessee would like me to explain again why elephants pushing down trees is good for the bush. Well, it's good for the grass, Kathy, and uh, the grass is good for a lot of the grazing species. So, we're in a drought, and we've had a very late eight, nine years, and the trees in some areas have taken over completely from the grass, and what that does is quite often it makes it more difficult for a lot of the herbivores uh, like wildebeest or your grazers, buffalo, let's just move on again, they're moving, uh, because the trees actually block out the sun for the grass to grow. So now we go through a dry period, the elephants are going to eat a lot of trees they wouldn't normally, so the elephants haven't eaten much grass this year because there hasn't been much around, but during your normal wet season elephants will eat in the summer months and the rainy season, 80% of their diet will be grass, but this year that hasn't happened. So they've fed off the trees and bushes for longer, and that will cause clearings. And then when we get our next set of rain, uh, the grass will be able to grow in those clearings because there's no trees for them to compete with. Hello, ladies. They are just so wonderful to spend time with. Hello, madam. Munching on a buffalo thorn. And the one next to it sort of picking on a baby jackalberry. They're not really feeding. I mean, if we, if we keep quiet and listen for a second to the amount of noise the elephants are making around us, Incredible. They can move so stealthily, but at the moment they are definitely not being stealthy. We're going to sit with these, le uh, these elephants for a bit longer. And while we do that, let's go across to Jamie, who's with some monkeys. Hello, big girl. We have some monkeys, but why we actually, what drew me here was the singing that was coming from this area. And I thought that it might be really nice to watch this monkey whilst accompanied by the tranquil sounds of the various staff members of Arethusa harmonizing beautifully, singing, so I couldn't quite understand from the distance that I'm at what they're singing about, but it was beautiful, and of course as we came across here they stopped singing, which is so disappointing. I'm hoping they might start up again while we watch this little one scratch at its cheek. Oh, well, we've got an Oriole. Whistling of an Oriole to keep us company. Here we go. Oh.
provide us with the soundtrack that we listen to on our day-to-day -day safari live but I thought you might enjoy something a little bit different because I certainly know that I am. I think it sounds absolutely beautiful. Moments like this that make living out in the African bush so incredibly special. Jonathan I'm sorry I've been so distracted by the beauty of their singing a little quiet applause. They have no idea that they are being listened, listened to by an audience of thousands. <laughs> the lovely ladies of the camp singing away. Um, Jonathan, these are vervet monkeys. Uh, we only actually really get... Oh, cute. <laughs> that one nearly fell over. We only actually get one species of what we would truly call or define as monkeys out here in the Sabi sand. In South Africa, we get the vervet monkey and a monkey called the Sykes or the Samango monkey. But they live much more in the forested or mountainous regions of the country. And then in terms of other primates, we also, of course, get the famous Chukma baboon that you may or may not have heard of in terms of its fearsome reputation as a bit of a thief and a thug and a gangster. And these little vervet monkeys are much more have a much more pleasant reputation, not that they can't be just as naughty when they want to be, as with all primates. Is that one sucking its thumb? Or has it actually got something in its hand? I think it does have something in its hand, but it did look like it was sucking its thumb there for a moment. Oh, getting vertigo just looking at it. Standing upright like that, right at the top of this enormous bourbon tree. So Jonathan, these are vervet monkeys. Afrikaans and blow arpy. And in Zulu, Mkau, named because it's a very onomatopoeic name, <coughs> it's named under alarm call. That. And we, oh hello, sorry guys, didn't mean to scare you. And we have the little monkeys of Arethusa to thank for our shadow and cub sighting. They were the ones who found her this morning. We came so close to finding her and we have their beady sharp eyes are a very useful tool as a guide if you learn how to listen to them. <laughs> and they are having an absolutely marvelous time. Ah, oh, Shamel, it's an absolute pleasure. Shamel saying that she, the singing is lovely and that it makes her homesick for her beloved South Africa. Well, Shamel, it's an absolute pleasure. I thought it made it for a nice change. We obviously would never do this every day on every safari, but since they're here and I never hear them singing at this time of evening, I don't know if it's somebody's birthday or something else, but it is beautiful. Absolutely stunning. And with a couple of mischievous vervet monkeys to watch as they clamber about the trees, even more so. Jonathan, just because I'd answer your que answered your question earlier, I didn't actually fully answer it. There was one more thing that I thought about in terms of our duties after, apart from hosting the Safari Live Drives, that I think is very, very important. And that is, we try to learn constantly 
because we've got viewers who've been watching for years and years and months and months and incredibly loyal viewers for which we are exceptionally grateful we do constantly because we do this every single day it's not like having new guests at the end of a week and you can reiterate the same information as before we try and keep up to date with the latest research the latest info whatever it is that we can find about the wonderful animals of Juma, partly because we're all built like that anyway, that is where our fascination with nature lies, but also partly so that we can constantly be providing accurate and true reflections of the African wildlife. These little guys nibbling away. And it's not the bourbine, sorry, I think the bourbine's behind it. This is a jackalberry, it's not a bourbine tree that they have secured a spot in and they will spend the night there tonight safely ensconced in the, 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 the tree's thick dark oh cute sorry oh little one oh there's a baby in Yala I'm sorry a slight problem with the tension here it's, it ran to the left oh it's so in the thick tamburtis now but there's an absolutely minute little baby that ran in here with the rest of the Inyala. That's moved off. Sorry, that was totally my fault. I got completely distracted. Oh, hopefully it's actually it's gonna come out in the open. If we do some judicious repositioning. Sorry monkeys, bye bye. And bye bye to the singing for now. <laughs> Sorry about that everybody constantly alert for things going on around us and this little baby in Yala is so tiny it's not quite as small as the one that you saw while I was on leave which I saw screenshots of and it looked absolutely adorable but it is exceptionally small let's try come on guys come out into the open oh I've lost it Let's just see if they do decide to come out. Ah, oh. sorry everyone. Got everybody all excited and the little baby has disappeared. Oh, hold on, might. There's the front runner of the group and the baby ran ahead to join her. She's going to pop out into that opening there. There we go. Come on, little one. I can actually see you. There, oh, <laughs> here we go. Well done, Jandre. Awesome camera work. Gave him a seriously tricky job there. Incy wincy. Little fluff ball of an Inyala. Probably only a couple of, probably maybe a week or two old. On solid legs, as all antelope species have to learn to walk and run. Pretty much as soon as they are born. It's an incredible thing. Oh, here we go, we're gonna get an open. One last glimpse. Because I think we could Oh, it's actually in the open already. Standing right out in the open. <laughs> Isn't that cute? With its giant fluffy tail. And the fluffy fur all down its back. Oh, very brave little baby leading the way. Stunning. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly pop my jacket on. Oh, I'm sorry. That was totally my mistake. I'm sorry, I'm trying to put my jacket on. They're listening. They've come for the singing as well. They've come to listen to the singing. I'm so glad you all enjoyed the music. I did sort of toss up whether or not to come here, but then I thought, well, if I wanted to listen to it, I'm sure that you all would as well. Okay. Let's 
going to think about this scenario for a second. Just so that you know, guys, Brent has gone back to the DRC for a checkup. Peter Bright is working on the problem as we speak. Just, um, the problem with that, of course, is that <laughs> Rusty's key won't turn. Hold on. <laughs> Bushwalk? <laughs> um, just, just hold on, every hold on, everybody. <laughs> Bravo! Magic touch. Now that was just sheer force. Rusty's, um, Rusty's ignition has always had a little penchant for keeping us guessing as to whether or not the key is ever going to turn. Uh, now, VM taught me a fantastic trick with that and it concerns a little bit of jiggling here and there. Whenever it locks, you've got to give it a little push and pull. I don't know. I've, as I've said to you before, VM the cameraman is actually a secret agent. I'm convinced of it. Or a double agent or something. He's something mysterious. And he has a way of solving that particular problem. So there we go. All is well. We are still on our own though. As Vendi has to have her signal sorted out. But that is quite alright. It is now getting too late, obviously for us to go and see Shadow, even if she has crossed. But we'll start heading back towards Juma. Perhaps we'll be lucky enough to encounter some of our hyenas. They might decide to pay us a visit. Even though we're feeling solidly rejected, since our clan has moved themselves to Manuleti, where they have found a den site there. Terribly disappointing. That music was beautiful though, that singing. I really enjoyed that. I'm so glad that you guys did too. I really did debate in my own mind whether or not we should go there. A big hello to HKP just on general questions on general subjects earlier on we stopped at those beautiful Impala and HKP was wanting to know or questioning whether or not Impala and Gazelle are the same thing they're not the same thing but they kind of are so essentially a gazelle is a type of antelope just like an Impala is a type of antelope and a springbuck is a type of antelope but the the Trafalagus family, the Kudu, the Nyala, the Bushbuck, they are a type of antelope. So all gazelle are antelopes, but not all antelopes are gazelle in one of those peculiar sort of Mensa style IQ tests. So Impala are not gazelle. They are, of course, related to gazelle in that they fall under the antelope ruminant heading. But we actually don't get any of the gazelle in this particular area. If you go up towards Central and Eastern Africa, Thompson's Gazelle, uh, you get all kinds of different gazelle springing around there and they essentially fill exactly the same ecological niche that our Impala do here. The same way if you go in towards the western parts of South Africa, you'll get the Springbok, which again, essentially fill the same ecological niche themselves. So Impala are not gazelle, although that's a very, very common misconception. They are their own type of antelope and in fact, bizarrely enough, Impala, unlike most of our antelope species, they fall under their own tribe completely. 
because antelope fa the antelope family is divided up into tribes in the Trafalagus ones or the ones I mentioned the cephalophines the, the, the small dwarf antelope the dakers, the steambok and so on the impala is one of the only ones out here that is all alone in terms of its family and in terms of its grouping its tribe within the family antelope and just an interesting strange little fact there for you and then as I said you go towards the Western Cape and you get the springbuck in those places and I think something very similar happens it's just a, ling a linguistic thing gazelle has sort of become synonymous with antelope and it's not really it's the same way where in a lot of countries particularly America a turtle refers to all of the Chelonian family which includes their own distinct grouping of tortoises turtles and terrapins all of which are different things but have all fallen under the heading of turtle and I think it's a very similar thing that's happened with the terming gazelle coming to mean all kinds of antelope all species of antelope there's definitely no harm in that it's just that it's a slightly distinct thing uh, this is one of the best times to be out in the African bush searching for all of the mysterious nocturnal creatures we had such a marvelous evening yesterday we pulled up next to the bush baby nest that we know about and since it's kind of I'm kind of tempted to do it again because it's on the way back home it's the the route that we were going to follow regardless I might decide to stop off there and see if that works although pushing it twice in a row might be a bit of an exception but we stopped at that little bush baby nest and we shone the torch at the entrance and he popped his head out he or she popped its head out through the hole and blinked at us sleepily with the most perfect timing and I suppose if you're driving hello guys off you go don't panic if you're driving out here ev all day, every day, you're bound to have those magic moments. I'm so glad they've packed this road with sand. It's very nice. Beautifully fixed. Well done. There was always a, a huge ditch here that you'd have to drive over. And absolutely, James Richards, that's also one of the things that I'm thinking of as we slowly make our way towards the western boundary of er Arethusa, no, of Juma, the western boundary of Juma, and then along it, is yes, I do think we could go and look for our jackal pair. I don't know why I feel like I'm sitting so low. I think it's because I, I borrowed this, no, I took this vehicle from Brent this afternoon. And Brent and myself are not exactly the same height <laughs> Jandre just gave a little giggle there behind me Jandre, um, <laughs> Jandre finds it funny because Brent and I are really not anywhere near the same height and I think that's why I think I'm missing an extra booster I really need to invest in some kind of cushion to help boost me up so that I don't feel quite so small in this Land Rover because now I'm sliding and trying desperately to stay on this combination of blankets that Brent is supplied and left behind. We're sharing the vehicle with two, with several people of very different sizes. James and myself, unfortunately, I think fall quite close into the same category. Whenever I get into this vehicle after Brent's been driving, he's he's got it basically as far back as it will go. And I can't even reach the pedals. I can, if I stretch. If I stretch and use my toes, I can touch the pedals, but that's about it. And I'm not short. I'm not that short. So we'll go look for our jackal, jackal pair, James Richard. We'll also stop at some point and have a look at the beautiful moon. Not just yet, though. We certainly have the camera for it though, and it is 
glancing up it is we're nearly at full moon I'm hoping that this cold front doesn't cover it with clouds Well, we'll just all have to keep our fingers very solidly crossed. I wonder where that came from. Sorry. I, mean, I was going to say keep our fingers crossed that Shadow decides to come across onto Juma at some point during the night. Although we'll have a good chance of finding her on Arethusa if she doesn't. Either way, it would be marvellous. But I wonder if any of you know the origin behind crossing one's fingers for luck because it's just occurred to me I have absolutely no idea and a lot of English expressions you can kind of guess at where they came from but I have no idea where crossing one's fingers stems from where that process stems from it sounds like it's almost a superstition and so if any of you know I would be thrilled to hear from you if you can tell me why we use the term crossing fingers in order to bring ourselves luck or indeed touch on wood to stop things from going badly oh please stay like that that's really cool how awesome is that they are such beautiful birds plucking their way underneath the bark before bedtime look at that We've got some juveniles in this group as well there might even be a smittable but in this case these are red billed wood, wood hoopoos or green wood hoopoos those are just the juveniles by the way with the black bulls so those are not smittables those are juvenile wood hoopoos Here's another one. When they only acquire their bright red bill when they reach full maturity. Now the adult was the one that you saw first, and that's where the name Red Bulled Wood Hoopoo comes from. It is now the official name is now Green Wood Hoopoo. But these are juvenile wood hoopoos. How awesome is that? Squeaking away. Oh, right down into that hollow. I wonder what's in there. An adult. An adult. Is that where the adult went? Oh, there's the adult. Oh, I see. Oh, wow. They're still nesting in a hole there. That's incredible if that's the case. I wouldn't have expected them to go deep into that hole. I had no idea that happened at that age. Obviously, I knew that wood hoopoos roosted in holes, or, I mean, sorry, not roosted, had nests in holes, but I did not know that they roosted at night with almost fully go grown offspring. Whenever I've found them sleeping, I've always found them sleeping all bundled together. Oh, here comes the rest of the group. The rest of the adults. Oh, ah, perhaps not settling down, perhaps just exploring <laughs> here you go you've got such a cool contrast there between the adult and the right bottom and the juvenile top left well off you pop best go and catch up with the rest of them These are definitely one of my favorite birds to see, especially whenever I go home to Johannesburg, which has some extraordinary bird life. And you see them doing their cackling, laughing call, where all of them get involved. As soon as one starts to call, the rest of them join, and they all start rocking back, back and forth upon the branches. Begging. Begging for food. There is a bird in there, isn't there? 
Where am I imagining that? There is a bird in there. This is fascinating. Oh, there is. How cool is that? They've got a maze of holes in this particular silver cluster leaf tree. I always knew that wood hoopers, just before they went to bed, they often perched in a next door tree, made a lot of noise. Oh, gone. <laughs> Whoops, your whole family's gone, buddy. You better catch up with them. Oh no, there must still be an adult in there. But yes, I always knew that they made a lot of noise in a neighbouring tree and then moved off quietly to roost in a nearby one. So kind of like they were, it's like a diversion tactic, drawing attention to one tree and then going and roosting in the other. But I'm surprised to see them going in and out of, this, out of these holes. And now they're coming back again. So they must be planning on roosting. Well, maybe. We'll have to come here tomorrow and find out. I'm now intrigued. I know that they nest in holes, but I didn't realize that at this age, with the juveniles almost fully grown, that they would still all be trying to squish in there. Crossing fingers that we will <laughs> find out exactly what is going on here. I'm going to leave our wood hoopers to go to sleep. And the reason I said that with such great emphasis was thank you to Jen B. Who has given me the origin behind the term crossing fingers. And it is apparently something that is largely based on the Christian religion. So crossing fingers to invoke the power of the Christian cross or the, the symbolism of the Christian cross and as well as concentrating good spirits. Now there we go. Thank you very much to Jen B. I really appreciate that answer. I've often wondered about it and I've never really fully got around to, to properly... You know when you, you just take something for granted because you've always known. You've always said it your entire life. And you actually haven't questioned why you say it. Now that's a really useful little tidbit of information that I promise you, now that I've been told, I will never ever forget that. Now that was a really marvelous time spent with those wood hoopoos. Apparently the knock on wood idea came from people hitting trees to prevent bad spirits from hearing them and preventing them from having their good luck. I don't quite understand, perhaps cert I suppose certain trees have certain symbolic and almost protective beliefs attached to them, so maybe that's where that came from. I know certainly in a lot of local cultures around here, having a tree You've got to build the frame of your house, the door frame of your house, made of a certain wood. And you've got to make sure that it is a wood from a tree that is a good wood rather than a bad one. Sorry, I've got, a, I've got chaos here. Everybody bear with me one moment. This is usually stuff that would be done whilst we're off air, but since Brent is down... Oh, Wend Wendy's not down. Wendy is up. On that note, let's go to Brent for an update. Well, it looks like we've troubleshot the problem that was causing the black screen. Of course, it was not me. It was our technical director, Peter Bright. Now, something slightly amusing happened uh, during that. I, I walked into final control. Uh, Pete, and my lapel is not on, apparently. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't turn it off, so let me just double check. No, it's still on. We have levels on our side, final control.
Okay. Ah, camera mic. So, something quite amusing happened. So, I went to sit in the luxurious chairs of Final Control and watch Jamie as she drove around. And, uh, of course, when, they work, when P Pete's working on the car, the signal's off and we can't see the picture from Wendy. Um, and... <laughs> uh, Gerard and, 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 and Pete were at the vehicle, I was sitting in final control, talking nonsense, and suddenly the picture for uh, Wendy popped up, and there was an elephant standing right behind him, and <laughs> turned the camera right around, uh, sort of saying, Brent, you need to come help us here. So, of course, I charged out. I had a very stern word with that elephant, and it ran away, fortunately. Right. Uh, and what did I say? Hey, 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 for that! Something like that. Chased the Eddie away. There were two of them actually. And uh Kurt just uh, had a good idea. It was a, it was an elephant cow that he was chasing. He said we should name it Amy. After the movie, Chasing Amy. Amy the elephant, I don't think I'll recognize her. I was more concentrated on removing her. Now literally around our camp and around final control at the moment the elephants are everywhere. But I'm hoping that some other form of creature might pop in for a little drink uh, at the Gallego Pan. So I'm moving my way around there. Now, just in case you've... Um, just in case you guys missed what was happening earlier today, of course, Jamie found Shadow and the little gorgeous cub. And, uh, of course, there was also, we sat, spent some time within Kuhuma Lioness, and we did get a little glimpse of the cub, but not a great view, but always great to spend time with big cats. And, of course, lots of Ellie's around, and uh, just from the animals outside of our traverse zone, a quick update. Uh, quarantine was seen in, in Torchwood, but still quite far to the east of cheetah cut line and uh, two Birmingham boys have managed to catch themselves a young buffalo each uh, down in Torchwood as well and then I think the other two of the Nkuma ladies were also seen in Buffalo's Hook so they're out and about the cats hopefully we can find some more before the end of the sunset safari nearly getting dark enough for me to get my spotlight ready Who knows, maybe we might find a bush baby, or a genus, or a civet. This is one of my favorite little bush baby areas. Had some wonderful sightings around here. Of course, always a good area for leopard lion and hyena as well in these little myriad of river systems near Gallego and Voyatella camp. It's good to see that Wendy is back up and running to full speed and capabilities. <laughs> Sorry everybody, it appears as though an attack of the gremlins this evening has been on the cards. Well, luckily we are moving through into the evening and I'm really hoping for a porcupine sighting tonight. Might as well go all out. I've been waiting for one for days and days and months and months. Jandre says art fark. Don't even bother Jandre. I don't think I'm destined to see an art fark. There's some kind of weird... I, I don't want to call it a curse, but there's something about me that art farks just don't like. By the way, uh, Jandre figured out what it was just because we were talking about the fingers crossed and so on. And the fact, it's Sunday today. So all of that singing, it was church services for the staff of Arethusa. That's what that singing was about. Just so you know. Dare we stop here and have this happen twice in one day, or twice in two days, I mean. 
Knock knock. Is anybody home? Little one. Hello. Are we a bit too late? Are you sleeping? It's time to wake up. <laughs> Little bush baby. No movement. I can't hear anything. Well, it was a bit optimistic, wasn't it? <laughs> to expect it to happen two nights in a row. It just makes last night even more magical. <clears throat> and just have a look at how absolutely stunning our evening sky looks. This, with all of the dust in the air on the winter's evenings. It creates these breathtakingly beautiful, what did James call them? Awe-inspiringly savage sunsets. <laughs> Still not entirely sure what that means, but I'm having a good chuckle at it anyway. All right, well, either we've missed our appointment with the bush baby and it's headed out already, or it has in fact decided to spend a night elsewhere or, third option C, is little bush baby doesn't want to wake up. It wants to stay asleep. In that case, we shall listen. And we will leave it to sleep away. The bush baby equivalent of having a morning lion, of course, because they are nocturnal creatures. A bush baby, for our new viewers, is a tiny, tiny little primate. The smallest primate that we get out here much much tinier than the vervet monkeys we saw roughly this this long and only a couple of hundred grams but that is what a bush baby it's 200 grams actually i believe is the average weight of a bush baby The moon's disappeared. Would you like me to show it? I did promise to show the moon. That's a very good point. Jandre is keeping me in check, reminding me that I promised a viewing of the moon. And let us stop and watch. And it's actually even more beautiful for the clouds racing across the sky. I promise to keep very, very still, Jandre. Because, of course, the, go the further we zoom in, <laughs> the more every movement becomes incredibly pronounced. I oh, love this camera. It does provide us with some incredible moments. A nearly, nearly full moon. Not quite there, but almost. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's got to be the full moon. And with a zoom like this, you can even see the craters from interstellar impacts that would have happened at some point in the moon's history. And so much of life on Earth has been determined by the fact that we have a moon that orbits our planet. So much of life out here actually depends upon it, particularly in coastal and tidal regions. This looks so cool. As it bounces the reflection of the sun back to the earth. Not often we get to enjoy a view like this. <coughs> 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 
sorry, ruining the atmosphere of the moment and not keeping still, Chandra is going to be very cross. <laughs> It is truly beautiful to enjoy this moment of peace. It's been a very peaceful drive, actually. I'm happy. I set out to accomplish what I was trying to yesterday. It might have taken me 24 hours, but we got there eventually. And it's actually a really beautifully peaceful afternoon. It is exactly what Sunday evenings are all about. Now, speaking of Sunday evenings, since there are only two of us, out and about, and clearly Wendy's not quite up for fireside chat. We will not be having a fireside chat this evening. However, what we will do is be doing a bit of a chat on Facebook Live after we are finished with our sunset safari. So you'll be able to see Brent and myself, and we will have a little bit of a chat about a very special day that is tomorrow. It is Mandela Day. For all of us here in South Africa and of course around the world. You don't have to be South African in order to celebrate Mandela Day. So we will be chatting to you a little bit about that as we go into our Sunday evening. Now, to tear ourselves away from that extraordinary view. Bear with me one second. I appear to have become tangled in my microphone. It's attempting to work its way down my back. There we go. Jandre, of course, came up with the ingenious solution of popping our microphones in our hats, which works very well. I concede it works brilliantly. But for somebody who has fiddled with their hats their entire life, life it's very difficult to remember not to. Okay, let's go look for the jackal pair. Last few moments of our sunset safari. I found Brent with his bright Christmas tree of lights. He looks as though he's coming along central. I don't think you'll be able to see him. Oh, you might. Oh. Never mind, it's not Brent. Apparently Brent is stationary. <laughs> so not Brent. Somebody else. Well, the wonderful news is that when Brent is static, he has a signal, which is why apparently he is standing still, so that he doesn't miss the opportunity to say farewell to all of you. So for now, I'm going to send you across to Brent so that he can do his goodbyes, and I will catch up with you for the last few minutes of the Sunset Safari. So unfortunately, maybe we haven't problem solved the exact problem with the Wendy just yet. Hopefully we'll be able to sort it out now before tomorrow morning's sunrise safari. But it's been splendid having you on the back of the vehicle with us and we can't wait to do it again in a few short hours. Hopefully cats abound, wild dogs are play and elephants are trumpet on tomorrow's sunrise safari. So for the last few minutes of drive, let's send you back to Jamie. Oh, back across after a very brief goodbye from Brent. He definitely can't risk losing any signal. And you'll spend the last few moments of the sunset safari with us and let us see what we can find for you. Will it be a white-tailed mongoose or a genet or a honey badger? Winter is the absolute best time of year for you to come out and enjoy some of the smaller and more mysterious nocturnal creatures of the African bush. And let us find what we have in store, or what the night has in store for us perhaps is a better way. Last time Jandra and I were on a sunset drive we found a serval. A serval eating a something. We never figured out what it was. It was a serval eating something. A serval on a kill. And we spent a good 20 minutes or more with that serval, which I think is probably one of my best serval sites. In fact, yeah, it must be one of the best serval sightings of my life. Definitely my best serval sighting since working at Wild Earth. But perhaps a serval then. 
The serval is a medium-sized spotted cat, like a little miniature cheetah almost is kind of what it looks like. And you hardly ever get to see them. I have a feeling we might encounter some elephants as well on our way home. Very valid point from Aaron Hallis. I've been muttering away about what I would like to see. Aaron would like to know if there's any particular animal Jandre would like to see. Jandre? A polar bear. A polar bear, right. There we go. So we've got... Oh, I nearly turned into James there for a moment. I was about to say we've got our standard sensible response from Jandre. <laughs> I take that. You want to... I know, I would also like to see a polar bear. It's probably not going to happen tonight though. That's not possible. I mean, statistically, I know all things are meant to be possible, but that's not possible. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jandre, I don't mean to kill your dreams. Now, now I feel mean. I feel like I've hurt Jandre's feelings in telling him that he is not going to see a polar bear in the middle of the South African wilderness area. And you know what? Karma will be, I'll come around the corner and there will be a polar bear. Although I have to tell you, if that happens, if that happens, I will eat my hat, Jandre. How about that? Okay. Cardboard cutout does not count, just in case you're plotting something. <laughs> they have this cardboard cutout of a polar bear at the zoo to give um, people a sense of scale as to how big it is. And I remember as a child, it, it always used to be stored in this underground part of the Johannesburg Zoo. I remember as a kid running down there around into this dark and the power was out and there was this massive polar bear cut out looming over me. I'll never ever forget the sheer terror that struck me because I was convinced that the polar bear had escaped and was about to eat me. Just thinking about it now, it's taking me back. I'm going to have nightmares about that moment. <laughs> now I'm going to have bad dreams. No more dreaming of finding shadow. We found shadow today. Now I'm going to have nightmares of polar bears coming out of the bushes, lumbering out of the bushes. Sounds utterly terrifying, doesn't it? Wasn't it? Oh, it was Lost. There was a TV series with a polar bear on a tropical island. All right, apart from a polar bear, do you have a, a more realistic animal that you would like to see, Jandre? Although we're cutting things fine now. Aardwolf. Now an aardwolf is possible, and an aardwolf would be incredibly exciting. Brent swears blind, he saw one in Manuleti, or two in Manuleti. Jandre uh, says he's seen them, and that's not far away from us at all. So the smallest member of the hyena family an insectivore and an amazing little creature. Tiny little miniature hyena with the sloping back. Definitely doesn't have the solid jaws of its brown and spotted cousins. And an art wolf would definitely be the most exciting thing for us to see. One of the most exciting things we could possibly see. And it is possible. You could see them on our live safari. So there you go, Aaron. That is what Jandre, apart from the polar bear, Failing to offer him up a polar bear, that is what Jandre would like to see. I have to tell you though, Jandre, unfortunately, I think we have run out of time and it is time to say our goodbyes. So thank you to Jandre for his wonderful camera work as always, as well as to Rebecca and the lovely ladies in Final Control. Most importantly, a big thank you to all of us for joining us. I'm so sorry about the gremlins that attacked today, but we will be working on fixing them for the Sunrise the Safari. Join us there and have a marvellous day in between or a night, depending on where you are in the world.